This exploration was made possible by Curiosity Stream. An Athenian named Thucydides wrote a history of the Peloponnesian War. The work is a chronological history with a mix of philosophical overtones and secondhand reproductions of speeches from figures of the time. He described events in 427 BCE when Athens put down a rebellion of the Mytilenians. Unable to cope with the imperial forces, the Mytilenians surrendered. Back in Athens, a man named Cleon, described by Thucydides as the most violent man in Athens, carried a motion to not only punish the conspirators, but to put all male Mytilenians to death and enslave women and children. However, the assembly, second-guessing the decision to punish all Mytilenians, reconvened to take another vote. And on this occasion, Cleon rose to admonish the assembly for their softness in the face of a premeditated rebellion. Their democracy would be incapable of empire if they listened to equivocation from gifted speakers rather than the wisdom of the common man. And so the people of the assembly should stick to the original decision, made in the fury of the moment, to execute all male Mytilenians and enslave the rest. If you determine to rule, you must carry out your principle and punish the Mytilenians without yielding to present weakness. Punish them as they deserve and teach your allies by a striking example that the penalty of rebellion is death. The next to speak was Diodotus, who opposed the mass execution. The assembly should be wary of speakers who use the popular arts to dismiss proper deliberation of the issues. The punishment of death for the Mytilenians would serve as no deterrent. In fact, it would teach the opposite lesson. If the leaders of a city rebel, all people should fight to the very last whether they support the cause or not because the Athenians would come and kill everyone regardless. On the other hand, a surrendered yet intact city could still refund expenses and pay tribute afterwards. The assembly should consider it far more useful for the preservation of our empire to put up with injustice voluntarily than to put to death, however justly, those whom it is our interest to keep alive. Ultimately, the assembly voted with Diodotus, punishing the original conspirators but leaving the rest of the Mytilenians to live. You might believe the point of this story is that democracy leads to better outcomes, but might I just add, Cleon, the famous demagogue, appears in the historical record on multiple occasions. His populism and infamy are well known. Diodotus? Well, he appears only here in Thucydides. If his level-headedness extended beyond this speech, it's lost to history. One unmistakably positive development in American history has been the gradual inclusion of more citizens in the election process. For white men, the removal of property requirements to vote in the early 19th century, women's suffrage in 1920, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 forbid voter discrimination based on race, and the 26th Amendment ensured 18-year-olds fighting in Vietnam could vote for the politicians sending them there. Though the aspirational words of the Constitution foreshadowed expanded participation in elections, the original system set out by the founders operated with many limitations on its democratic elements, and not just on who could vote, but exactly how those votes counted. The only straightforward elections were to the House of Representatives. Voters chose representatives and they went to Washington. No democratic filter. By design, every other part of the federal government was to pass through a selection filter. Voters didn't directly elect senators, they chose state legislators who elected the two senators. Voters didn't directly elect the president, they advised electors of the electoral college, who then practiced independence selecting a president. Voters didn't elect Supreme Court justices, the indirectly elected president, with advice and consent of the indirectly elected senate, nominated justices to the high court. Democracy was intentionally minimized. Isolating the direct will of voters to one half of one branch of government, the House of Representatives, was the explicit intent of the founders. Just as the founders feared the tyranny of a monarch, they feared the tyranny of mob rule. The quotes sound shocking to modern ears. At the Constitutional Convention in 1787, a resolution was proposed which would make the future American Congress elected by the people. The immediate reaction was basically, election by the people, are you crazy? Roger Sherman of Connecticut was the first to speak up. The people, he said, immediately should have as little to do as may be about the government. Future Vice President Elbridge Gerry agreed, the evils we experience flow from the excess of democracy. The people do not want virtue, but are the dupes of pretended patriots. The sentiment continued after the Constitution's ratification. 
John Adams, the second president, wrote in 1814, Remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, observed that, Between a balanced republic and a democracy, the difference is like that between order and chaos. That final distinction between a republic and a democracy is where we need to place our attention. Let's clarify something. A 1787 understanding of a republic was different than today. Today we think of republics as governments elected by the people, but at the time of the founding, a republic, at the most basic, meant a government without a king or queen. The rights of citizens to participate played no role in whether the government fit the definition or not. So yes, a representative democracy would fit that definition, but so too would the Republic of Florence, where authority often laid not with the people, but with guilds and powerful families. And if the prevailing wisdom during the founding of the US was that direct democracies like Athens were prone to self-destruction, the same held for republics. History served as a graveyard of all sorts of republics in a world dominated by imperial monarchies. And so the challenge was, as far as the founders saw it, how to set up a republic that could protect things important to them. Life, liberty, property, long term. Inserting democratic elements into the new republic was, in their eyes, a risky addition to an already precarious form of government. James Madison, the largest intellectual influence on the American Constitution, had no issue criticizing the few examples of direct democracy in history. They were, he wrote in Federalist 10, as short in their lives as they had been violent in their deaths. Pure democracy, Madison said, would inevitably suffer at the hands of faction, by which he meant a self-interested group moving the majority towards poor decisions through impulse and passion, rule by partisans and the mob. He argued that the best option for controlling the effects of faction was to form a large republic with a limited scheme of representation, a democratic element at its heart. The way to prevent violations of basic liberties by factions was to spread the factions over a geographically large republic. If a populist mob in New Hampshire elected a demagogue to Congress, the odds of the movement gaining traction and electing a representative all the way down in Virginia were slim to none making it hard for them to impact national policy. Therefore, the new and large American Republic could have a democratic element at its heart, the House of Representatives, because its geography would help prevent the formation of an overbearing and liberty-destroying majority. And so, taking Madison's lead, the founders set up a large republic with limited democracy and limited participation. And we can set that system on an admittedly imperfect spectrum of pure republic and pure democracy. On the right side, the pure democracy, in which every citizen participates in every decision. The closest approximation we have is ancient Athens, where a significant number of men could partake in the assembly. On the left, a pure republic, where the populace has no direct say in governance, but there's no king or queen. Again, we have to approximate with Florence and its guilds and powerful families. The New American Republic would tend pretty far to the left on the spectrum, as the popular will was filtered by exclusion and institution. But of course, the United States would not be stagnant. Developments would make the system more democratic over time. As we noted before, through constitutional amendment and legislation, more Americans were able to exercise their right to vote and to participate as citizens. Notably, the 17th Amendment meant that senators would be directly elected by the people, not by state legislatures. So as of 1913, the entire legislative branch was popularly elected, not just the House of Representatives. But that still leaves two of three branches of government as quite distant from the popular will, the judiciary and the executive. I want to focus on the executive in particular because to describe a modern president of the United States as merely a distant and indirectly elected official would deny reality before our very eyes. To the domestic population and the world, the president is the face of the United States. Their opinions can dominate the news cycle and policy agenda. They commit troops around the world, take credit or blame for the economy, help or hinder healing in times of national crisis, speak to us on a yearly basis about how the country is doing, and feature in the stories we tell each other about ourselves. Presidents occupy a space in the national psyche of someone democratically directly elected. And yet, they're not. What can explain this disparity? We've established that the haven for democracy in the American Republic was supposed to be the House of Representatives. The founders envisioned citizens having a much closer connection to their local members of Congress than to their president. 
by the way, given such a mundane name as president because the main function would be just that, presiding over the policy decisions of the Congress. The president in this vision, or maybe fantasy of the founders, would be an enlightened statesman, known by the general population only insofar as he gathered governing experience and served the country well. He would recognize no political party and harbor no deep ambitions of power. Selected by the wise men of the Electoral College, the president would blend into the background with few explicit powers, and would avoid what they called the popular arts to influence the public. He would be basically George Washington. But as we know, the presidency didn't evolve this way. The office expanded in influence with only a couple pauses in between, and most presidents retained and broadened the powers of their predecessor. There are many ways scholars approach this so-called imperial presidency from the expansion of the country generally, necessity in times of civil unrest, and individuals that set precedents for every president that came after them. But one overlooked way of examining how presidential power and influence has changed over time is the way individuals become candidates for president in the first place. Selection by a major political party. That selection process by the political parties, though outside of the constitution itself, has become more democratic with time, changing expectations for presidents and altering the balance in our system of government. For a long time, the public played no role in selecting presidential candidates. Members of Congress from the major political parties gathered together in secret to choose their candidates for the upcoming election. And that was it. And as elitist and exclusive as that sounds, it was in line with the intent of the founders for an ambitionless president that presided. The candidates tended to be insiders and politically experienced. On multiple occasions, elections were settled by handshakes in the House of Representatives. Presidential cycles looked less like a modern general election, and more like a fraternal squabble on the floor of the UK House of Lords. So if we create another spectrum, not for the whole political system, but just for the presidential candidate selection system, and again place a fully democratic system on the right, where the general public has a 100% say in who candidates for president will be, the original selection system with members of Congress meeting in secret would be far to the other side, a nearly 100% elite selection process. But these secret congressional caucuses were unsustainable, and the cult of personality surrounding one man changed it all. When President Andrew Jackson was up for re-election in 1832, the new Democratic Party tried something quite different. General Jackson had been personally popular with voters because of his war record in the Battle of New Orleans. This personal popularity often put him at extreme odds with the political establishment in Congress. So for his re-election, rather than nominate a vice presidential candidate by secret congressional caucus, his Democratic Party tried something a little more inclusive, more democratic. They held a national convention, the first of its kind for a major party. From now on, candidates wouldn't be chosen in the stuffy halls of Congress by a select few, they would be chosen by all attending members of the party in an open, participatory way. National conventions became the norm, and major parties nominated presidential candidates this way for the next 136 years. Now, in retrospect, we know these national conventions were more theater than democracy. Attendees were usually highly influential members of the party, delegates bought off by party bosses, and real decision-making happened behind closed doors in smoky rooms, well away from the convention floor. But at its core, it was more pluralist. More interests were at the table, even if they were moneyed, well-connected, and white. Rather than just elected political elite, you could find broad coalitions of business, political activists, geographic groupings, and religious cohorts. The political parties themselves were at their strongest because they served as moderating influences on candidates who needed to appeal to the widest cross-section of interest to get nominated. Wild ambition was controlled because candidates who might promise large changes to win the hearts of the voting public would never make it past the business advocates at the convention. The candidates who made it out were likely whittled advocates of something close to the status quo. If we head back to our spectrum, the national convention certainly moved the presidential nomination process away from the select few making the decision, but only because now it would be the select hundreds, the select thousands instead. The process was still closed to the general public, and nominees could only make limited claims about wielding the popular will. For this very reason, at the turn of the 20th century, the parties were being pushed to reform. 
In 1897, before entering public life, future President Woodrow Wilson was already contemplating ways to rip the nomination system out of the tight control of the party establishments. He was openly hostile to the national conventions, seeing them as the process by which special interests nominated candidates with no policies derived from the popular will. He wrote that national conventions were an incalculable number of local influences, utterly obscure to the country at large and unconnected, as we know, with any general party purpose or policy of which the country can know anything. Candidates selected not by the general voice of any party, but upon grounds of preference which only their special friends and partisans can explain. In short, the process for selecting presidential candidates wasn't democratic, and Woodrow Wilson wanted to make it so. Only then could Americans remedy the issue of what he called leaderless government. And so in his first annual message to Congress, President Woodrow Wilson proposed expansion to a developing phenomenon, presidential primaries. I urge the prompt enactment of legislation which will provide for primary elections throughout the country, at which the voters of the several parties may choose their nominees for the presidency without the intervention of nominating conventions. The Democratic and Republican parties, of course, didn't eliminate their national conventions, but some states were moving in Wilson's direction, creating a hybrid of old and new. From 1912 to 1968, in any given nomination cycle, between 12 and 20 states held presidential primaries. The goal of these primaries was for voters to elect delegates to the national convention where they would help choose the party candidate. However, the reality during these years was that the delegates sent from the primaries generally played an extremely limited role in influencing who the nominee would be. The system had budged in the direction of democratization, but the political parties still had the final say in who their presidential candidate would be. And it was never more clear that the parties were still in control than at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. 14 states held primaries, which resulted in 80% of votes cast for candidates pledging to end the war in Vietnam. However, at the convention, the Democratic nomination went to Hubert Humphrey, who supported the status quo in Vietnam. More important to our discussion, he hadn't even participated in a single primary. This contributed to the unrest outside the convention, where anti-war protests turned violent. Humphrey's nomination convinced many outsiders that the old party bosses still ran the theater. The primaries were just a show on the stage and the violence convinced many insiders that more reforms were needed to make political parties more accountable to the popular will. The ensuing 50 years have been a cascade of change derived from the turbulence of 1968 and a fulfillment of Woodrow Wilson's vision for a national system of primaries. Both the Republican and Democratic parties have expanded their system to include all 50 states, DC, Puerto Rico, and Guam. And even though the state party organizations and the national committees still meddle with rules and mingle with dates, there is, effectively, a system of national binding popular primaries. It's not purely democratic, but it's fair to say that primary voters choose presidential candidates. It's a system which, as it evolved, set up the dark horse candidacy of Jimmy Carter, empowered the popular movement behind Ronald Reagan, elevated Barack Obama over the party establishment, and bent the entirety of the Republican Party around Donald Trump. It's a system that's wildly different than the secret congressional caucuses of the early republic. National conventions severed the president from Congress, and now presidential primaries sever the president from the establishment of the political parties. With a national convention, candidates conform to the party. But with primaries, parties conform to the candidate. To get onto the general election ballot, candidates have to build support with blocks of active voters and prove they can win long before actual election day. In turn, they will have a popular mandate from which to govern. We now see one way the presidency democratized without direct changes to the Constitution. The explicit goal of progressives like Woodrow Wilson was to create a presidency based on popular leadership. Power would derive from the popular will not the institutional constraints from the Constitution. And I'm hoping by now you've started to gather what the potential consequences of something like this might be. I said earlier that the general democratization of the American government has been unequivocally good, particularly when it comes to expanded participation. I stand by that. However, I think it's essential and probably unpopular to make a much more subtle argument about the democratization of the presidential nomination system. James W. Caesar, who wrote a comprehensive book on this subject, 
pointed out a couple assumptions from advocates of a national primary system. One, the belief that the people on their own can be fully trusted to choose leaders without the guidance of restrictive electoral institutions. And two, there is the view that no serious side effects flow from an open pursuit of the nomination, that self-interest and ambition, if they exist, do not lead aspirants to divide and inflame the populace. Now, as to number one, can the people be fully trusted to choose their leaders? Well, history shows humans have a rough track record on that, but that is no reason to deny ourselves the right to try. If we grant ourselves the inalienable right to pursue our vision of the public good, to directly choose candidates for president rather than be bestowed with them, we're left with the responsibility to deal with the side effects such a system produces. The first potential side effect is the experience gap. The national conventions generally nominated presidents with governing experience, but who might be less interested in putting that experience towards the direct will of the people? A primary system has the opposite problem. Candidates who are more in tune with the will of the voters, but who might be less experienced in actually governing. They might be able to talk the talk, but to use a hackneyed phrase, they might not be able to get things done. Look again at the old way, the national convention. The skill set there to navigate the varied interests of powerful stakeholders and get the nomination is similar to the act of navigating the powerful stakeholders and governing in Washington. To contrast, the skill set to successfully campaign in a presidential primary, the popular arts of rhetoric and seeming sincere, are not particularly helpful when trying to get Congress to pass that meaningful piece of legislation or steering a federal agency. The process of governance isn't nearly as lofty as campaigning. This means as primary voters, we have to question whether what we're being sold is realistic. And not just whether the policy is realistic, but whether its passage is realistic. This isn't an argument for moderation, by the way. It is often the advocates of unjust, mushy, both sides are bad middle ground who have stood in the way of meaningful changes to civil rights and economic reforms. It is merely our task to listen to the promises made by primary candidates in a holistic fashion. Otherwise, we'll find ourselves stuck with presidents incapable of administration that involves anything other than the unilateral jerking of a pin. Which leads nicely into side effect two, the demagogue problem. Caesar predicted when he wrote his book back in the 70s that the primaries would start to bring us factional leaders, in the Madisonian sense. To build on that, primaries would bring us popular leaders who would intentionally ram wedges into societal cleavages, exploit our anger, Tell us that the only way to bring true power to the people is to join the cult of personality, break some rules, and bring down the other side. Decisions made in the fury of the moment are for the better. This problem is inevitable. It is the flaw of humans and democracies in particular. All I can say is that if you don't see the world this way, you must participate because democracy is fragile. The country is young and our process for selecting presidential candidates even younger. How it evolves from here is up to us. We are living in an experiment. Whether the primary system fulfills the goal laid out by James Madison in Federalist 52, the aim of every political constitution is, or ought to be, first to obtain rulers, men who possess most wisdom to discern and most virtue to pursue the common good of the society. The founders feared that the general population couldn't handle the responsibilities that came when systems approached direct democracy. That demagogues would come along and tell us angry lies to inflame the passions. Use the popular arts to whip us into factional extremes that would destroy our liberty. It is our job to prove them wrong. I love history. That's why I'm excited to bring you something with a lot of it. Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is a streaming service that offers over 2,000 documentaries and non-fiction titles from some of the world's best filmmakers, including exclusive originals. Originally founded by John Hendricks, founder of the Discovery Channel, it's packed full of content about science, nature, technology, society, and yes, lots of history. I personally enjoyed the series called Asia's Monarchies, but a quick dive into the history section has ancient history, biographies, prehistory, even niche history like megastructures and aviation. Unlimited access starts at $2.99 a month, but for this community, the first 30 days are free if you follow the link in the description and use promo code THEEXPLORATION at sign up. So head on over to curiositystream.com slash theexploration and use promo code THEEXPLORATION for 30 days free access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series.
Later, guys. <laughs>